grateful to be before you tonight in spite of the inclement weather that we're experiencing right now. What I want to talk to you uh, tonight about is, well, we can do a little history lesson first and then uh, we'll have an application of it. During the uh, period uh, 1776 through 1778, the uh, U.S. operated under uh, Articles of Confederation. Now, it, that Article of Confederation had many weaknesses. Uh, the chief of those was the lack of a, an executive to administer the government, the inability to regulate commerce between and among the states, and the authority and power to raise revenue from taxation. Because of these weaknesses, delegates from the various states uh, went to uh, Pennsylvania, met there ostensibly to amend the articles, but they in fact drafted a wholly new constitution to replace the articles, going way beyond their mandate for meeting. <clears throat> the delegates, however, were fearful of investing too much power in a central government. This fear had its basis in history because they had just revolted against King George III and were successful in that. And in the propensity for humankind to usurp power and to rule as a despot, Romans 3.23. Therefore, the U.S. Constitution was designed to establish a form of government that allowed it to, quote, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. To limit the power of a central government, three branches were established with checks by one on the other as the so-called checks and balances in the government. In formulating the provisions of the Constitution, delegates to the convention spent four months in discussion, investigation, deliberation, and often heated debate. Although most delegates were fearful of investing too much power in a central government, regardless of the necessity of a centralized authority to a well-functioning government of a new nation. The eventual result was a marvelous document we know as the U.S. Constitution. However, the delegates recognized that it was not perfect and provided Article 5 uh, in that article a provision for its amendment. Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution states, this Constitution and the laws of the United States will, which shall be made in pursuance thereof in all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. It is one thing to draft a new Constitution with all of its provisions. It is altogether a, a different to decide on its application to the real world. It was important to do so since it was the supreme law of the land. And quite frankly, the government didn't really know how to apply all these provisions. Now the consensus pick for the first president of the United States was George Washington. At the time, there were but four cabinet members the Secretary of State was Thomas Jefferson. Secretary of the Treasury was um, Alexander Hamilton. You know, he's on your $10 bill. The Secretary of War was occupied by Henry Knox, and Fort Knox was named for him. And the Attorney General occupied by Edmund Randolph. And Rudolph the Randolph, no there was not named for him. So. <laughs> Anyway, Hamilton and Jefferson, uh, they both possessed uh, brilliant minds, and 
They were highly persuasive and influential among their peers. They held two opposing views of the power and the authority granted to the central government by the Constitution. And since they occupied the two most powerful cabinet positions, they were positioned to promote their respective views of the power of the central government. The view held by Hamilton was that the central government should have broad powers at the sacrifice of state powers. Jefferson, on the other hand, was not willing to yield too much power to the central government or too much authority to elected federal officials uh, or to the federal bureaucracy. Hamilton would be known as a Federalist and Johnson Jefferson as a anti-federalist, or as we re refer to it today, a uh, loose constructionist and a strict constructionist of the Constitution. It uh, must be noted that Hamilton was a highly effective Secretary of the Treasury. He implemented plans and policies that consolidated the wartime debt and provided for its liquidation. He was responsible for the imposition of tariffs on foreign trade and on production of alcoholic beverages. Now, if you know your history, you uh, this excise tax on alcoholic beverages led to the so-called Whiskey Rebellion, which was put down by an army led by President Washington and that is the only time in American history that a president of the United States has commanded an army in the field. But nevertheless, uh, revenue began to flow into the Treasury. Hamilton's goal was not only the solvency of the U.S., but also to increase the fluid capital of the country, to improve business facilities, and to make credit more available. To accomplish the latter, Hamilton proposed that the United States charter a national bank with the federal government as its principal stockholder. It would be called the, called the uh, United States Bank. It, it was not the Bank of America. I don't, don't think that was the national bank. <laughs> there was much good that a national bank could do for a new nation that essentially had no bank or banks that could serve the national market just didn't have any, hadn't been hadn't developed yet. But Jefferson, along with uh, James Madison, feared the concentration of power that a national bank would provide. The force of Jefferson's objections at the time lay in his contention that, contention that the words of the Constitution meant precisely what they said. If the gist of Jefferson's argument was that the Constitution meant literally what it said, Hamilton's argument was that it meant more than it appeared to. Starting with the sovereignty of the United States, he asserted a positive political philosophy emphasizing what the government could do, not what it could not do. He based his argument on the general proposition that every power invested in any government is in its nature sovereign and includes a right to employ all means that are requisite and applicable to the attainment of the ends of such power. If we were to characterize the two opposing arguments, we could say that Jefferson is saying that the language of the Constitution does not explicitly or implicitly, implicitly authorize a national bank. On the other hand, Hamilton could say that there is nothing in the Constitution prohibiting the establishment of a national bank. <clears throat> there is not a line in the Constitution that says, thou shalt not have the government engaging in the banking business. The question thus is, shall we be governed by what the Constitution and the law of the land says, or shall we be at liberty to provide any measure inaugurate any system or engage in any kind of business provided the Constitution does not specifically forbid it. Now, I just want to add a little side note here that 
on the uh, U.S. Supreme Court today is there are no Jeffersonian strict constructionists. There are what we call strict constructionists and the liberal uh, loose constructionists, but not in the Jeffersonian order of things. Now, you might ask, what does this have to do with biblical principles? Well, this has to do with our approach to, to the Word of God. We have our Constitution, namely the Word of God. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, it is not subject to amendment. It is infallible. Do we propose to be governed only by what the rightly divided Word of God authorizes, either explicitly or implicitly, or are we additionally permitted to engage in that which it does not explicitly prohibit? The differences between Hamilton and Jefferson were not on the merits of a national bank, but whether such an institution owned and operated by the federal government was authorized by the Constitution. Now, with respect to the uh, Word of God, let's look at uh, a few examples. <clears throat> in Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 3 through 5, we read, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, both Cain and Abel were engaging in acts of worship to God. We can infer from the text what God's instructions were with respect to proper worship. After all, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. God says what faith is, but he does not enumerate every action that is not faith. We read further in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, uh, verse 4, that by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he had obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, and though uh, through it he being dead still speaks. Is there something inherently wrong in offering fruit of the ground? Only one thing. Nothing but animal sacrifice was authorized, which by the very principle of authority precludes everything else. When God told Noah to build an ark, he gave Noah, Noah specific instructions. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses 14 through 17, it reads, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubic from above, and set the door in the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And in, down in verse 22, it says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Now, what if Noah <clears throat> put in two windows rather than a window? After all, technically speaking, there is a window if there are two. But the instructions were specific, a window. And thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, and he did no more than that. So what would have happened if he had added a second window? Certainly the ark would not have floated, even though it involved only windows. Moses is known as the great lawgiver, for it was on Mount Sinai that the Ten Commandments and following that, all the attendant the laws attached thereto were given by Moses. And it was Moses who said that you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you, Deuteronomy 4th chapter, verse 2. 
There were no Federalists and Anti-Federalists in Moses' day. Then again, maybe there were. We read in the 10th chapter of Leviticus that the priest Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. The reasoning that the Lord gave was this, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Leviticus, the 10th chapter, verses uh, 3. It is apparent from this passage that adding to or taking away from the word as commanded is not regarding the Lord as holy and is not glorifying the Lord. Regardless of whether Nadab and Abihu considered this a serious matter, it was. Serious business, this word of God is. When David determined to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, he reigns that the ark be transported on a new cart. During the trip, Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen had stumbled. He died instantly, 1 Chronicles 13th chapter. He died because the ark was not being transported in the proper manner. Only the Levites were authorized to transport the ark. After David acknowledged that no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. First Chronicles 15, chapter verse 2. Only then could the ark be transported to Jerusalem. It was as if the Lord said to use a van and David used a pickup truck. Small differences but it cost us a, his life. When it comes to obedience to the word of God, small things matter. There are many other examples in the Old Testament of uh, loose constructionists. Saul's failure to utterly destroy the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15 chapter. Moses' disobedience in the wilderness of Zen, Numbers 27 chapter, verse 14. The man gathering sticks on the Sabbath, in, uh, Numbers uh, 15, chapter verses 32 and 33, and you can go on and you can find many more examples. Christ, in being tempted by Satan, lays down an especially important principle. In Matthew 4, chapter verses 1 through 4, we read that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now, when the, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's an important principle to remember. This principle is reinforced by the reading in Hebrews, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we must give the most, more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts to the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And in 2 John verses 9 through 10, whoever transgress <coughs> transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. <coughs> he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And the question tonight is, are you determined to be led by God's word and not by your own wants and wishes, likes and dislikes? Do you recall that when the Hebrew children were led out of Egypt, that a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night led the way? When the pillars moved, they moved. 
When the pillars stood still, they stood still. In the same fashion, God's word is our pillar. We only go where it points the way, and we refrain from any other way. So, what is a safe course in this life? Let us do only what the Constitution says, and not presume to go beyond it. The claim that we make to speak where the Bible speaks, to keep silent where the Bible is silent, to do Bible things in Bible ways, and for the reasons given by the Bible. This gives the only possible basis for being acceptable to God. The only safe course in this life is to take God at his word, believe what he says, become and be just what God requires, and then live as his word directs, worship as he decrees, and practice those things, and only those things for which there is authority in God's holy word. And if you want to become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, with no creed other than the Bible, which is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path, and become a member of the only organization of the saved, we extend to you the gospel's call. Or if you have need of repenting of sins that have separated you from God, we also offer that opportunity as we stand and sing. <laughs>